This presentation is on the author, Frances Burney, her novel, Evelina. Um, the quote there, I think there ought to be a book of the laws and customs a la mode presented to all young people upon their first introduction into public company. That's a quote from uh, Evelina writing to uh, her guardian, Reverend Villers. Talk a little bit about Frances Burney before we get into the novel. There's her portrait done by a cousin, I think. So she was born in 1752. Her father, Charles Burney, was a composer and musicologist. You see him there in a portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds. He's got a rolled up piece of sheet music there, like he's going to swat a puppy with it. Uh, her mother, Esther Burney, uh, would die when she was uh, just 10 years old. In 1760, at the age of around eight, the Burneys moved to London, and Charles joins uh, Samuel Johnson's club. Uh, and this, this brought the whole London intellectual world into, into Francis Burney's life at a very young age. Uh, her mother died, like I said, uh, in 1762, and around this time, uh, a playwright named Samuel Crisp, um, who was part of this the the, the London theater world, uh, began encouraging Francis to to take up writing. This is not something that her father supported uh, greatly. Um, for some reason, I don't know all the, the details behind that. There's perhaps she had a, uh, uh, a learning disability. She may have been dyslexic in her childhood. Any case. With her assistance in 1775, her father published the first volume of his four volume general history of music, which was pretty well received at the time. Uh, what Fanny did for him was she she wrote out the uh, the manuscript of the um, of the first volume for publication to send to the printer, and this created a kind of problem because she was also at this time working on her first novel, Evelina, and she was doing so in secretly. She didn't want her father to know about it, and in fact, her father would have disapproved. Um, and this secrecy involved making sure that her handwriting looked different so that printers wouldn't recognize her manuscript from uh, the work that she did as amanuensis for, for her father's history of music. In 1778, Evelina was published uh, anonymously. You can see, looking at the title page of the fourth edition there from 1779, that her name does not appear on the title page, although by this point she had already been outed. Everybody knew um, that she had written the novel. It was wildly successful, uh, very popular. Samuel Johnson loved it, and it went through several editions, several editions with slight revisions over the next 12 months. Um, by the fourth edition there, there were, there were um, illustrations, frontispiece illustrations for it. Um, at this time, she builds a close personal friendship with a woman named named Hester Thrale. She was herself a published a published writer, and um, a close a close friend and um, a lover, perhaps, of Samuel Johnson. And the two were often together. And Francis Burney was often with both of them. Um, at Hester Thrale's house in Bath, where uh, Francis is in fact buried. In 1779, she completed a play, uh, a comedy of manners called The Whitlings. This was an attempt to quickly capitalize on the success of Evelina, and she would write a number of plays in the years ahead, most of which were never produced in her lifetime, or if they were, they weren't successful. And they remained unpublished uh, until the 1990s. So only recently have uh, these, these plays become accessible to literary scholars. In 
Her second novel, Cecilia, appeared in 1772. What's interesting about this novel is that she dropped the epistolary format. Evelina, of course, as you already have figured out, is an epistolary novel. And uh, this novel, Cecilia, um, uses an omniscient narrator. Uh, and this would, this would have tremendous influence on Jane Austen's novels. In 1786, she entered the royal household as Keeper of the Robes to Queen Charlotte. Uh, this really turned out to put a, it put a real, it really hampered her writing career. Uh, she was very unhappy in this job and she, she got out of it as quickly as she could. Uh, during this time, she did write a series of tragedies, uh, only one of which was produced. And uh, they, they all, I believe all of them, um, are historical tragedies set during, you know, ancient, uh, set set in ancient British history, like Anglo-Saxon times, you know, pre-Norman conquest. I don't know much about these tragedies. What I've read is that they're they're pretty challenging. In 1793, um, now in her her early 40s, um, she finally marries, and and this is unusual. I mean, she she had turned down um, several suitors for uh, reasons that I I can't explain, but um, there were um, um, matches that that uh, relationships that fell through. But in 1793, she married a French military officer, Alexandre de Arble, who had served under Lafayette. Um, and he had immigrated to England um, in the early 1790s to escape the, the partisan revolutionary violence in France. He was, he was more of a moderate constitutionalist. He wasn't as radicalized as the group that was in power chopping people's heads off. So in 1796, she published her third novel, Camilla. It was also quite successful. A third of four. She wrote four novels total. In 1802, uh, Alessandra accepts an appointment under Napoleon Bonaparte and relocates, uh, the f who relocates the family to France. Um, Immediately, uh, war with England starts in 1802, and this keeps Frances there for a decade. She's with her husband, and now by this point, she's a mother. She has a son at this point, who I think is, oh, six or seven years old, probably. In 1811, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and um, underwent a successful surgery, a mastectomy, to, to remove it, and... I mention this because her description of the procedure is, is absolutely harrowing. Um, there was no anesthesia, and so she went under the knife fully conscious, and she remained conscious throughout the entire very painful procedure, and her description of it is, is graphic and, and memorable. She describes the, um, the surgical blades you know, scraping against um, the bones in her breast, just quite a, quite a record of... Um, of early surgery. So her last novel, uh, The Wanderer, appeared in 1814. And not surprisingly, it's it's based on her experiences in the 1790s and going to France. It's set during the French Revolution. Um, it is not, it was not received as favorably as her earlier novels, however. In 1815, she moves to Belgium. This is the year of Waterloo, Napoleon's final defeat, and she treated soldiers wounded at that battle. Um, pretty remarkable that she that she you know witnessed this event. You know, one of the major battles in modern history. Um, her husband is injured, and they they move back to England and they settle in the the town of Bath. And he died of cancer himself in 1818. She would also outlive her son, actually. Her last major publication were, was the, the memoirs of, of her father, um, which came out in 1832. And then she lived on until 1840 and died at the age of 87. So a remarkably long life. I mean, she was born 
before many of the writers that we've read, Alexander Pope, um, a lot of the writers we associate with the 18th century, and she lived into the Victorian period. So a remarkably long life. She saw lots of change in her time. So we'll talk now about her most famous novel, Evelina, which again was published in 1778. And like Pamela, Evelina is an epistolary novel, but unlike Richardson's novel, which you'll recall is set primarily in private spaces like, like bedrooms, dining rooms, gardens, private gardens, Bernie's is, novel is more concerned with social life, and most of it takes place in very public spaces, in theaters, dance halls, parks, uh, the streets. It also gives us a very different view of 18th century London than what we find in Defoe, whose characters you'll recall inhabit this grim, dark, dangerous, urban underworld uh, of crime and, and uh, prostitution. So Evelina uh, puts London high society on full display, though it's certainly not without its vices and uh, her satire of both the, um, the upper and middle classes is, is pretty biting. So there are three strands that I want to talk about, three novelistic strands. And by, by the late 18th century, the, the novel began to to, as a genre began to splinter and there began to be different kinds of novels like gothic novels, novels of horror uh, would be one that I'm particularly fond of. The three I'm going to talk about here are the Bildungsroman novel. This was a novel um, that, that originated in uh, Germany. Some of the most famous Bildungsroman novels are by, um, well, the most famous one is by uh, Goethe, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship. We'll talk more about this in a moment. And there's the novel of manners. And then finally, the third one is the sentimental novel. And I'll define each of these uh, just very basic definitions um, to give us something to talk about when we discuss the novel in class. So the Bildungsroman is a, is a coming of age novel that follows a youthful protagonist's psychological and moral development. These usually involve a series of experiences and conflicts that prepare the character for assimilation and acceptance into adult society. Kind of overlapping with that is the novel of manners, which is a comedic genre uh, that depends for its humor on the complex, highly complicated protocols of social behavior. Uh, so the importance of adhering to the rules and then the sometimes very severe consequences for breaking those rules. And just to give you a quick example, there, there's, there's Evelina's uh, situation, uh, her consternation after she declines Mr. Lovell at the ball, uh, who invites her to dance. And then, and then she's observed later with Lord Orville and she's, she's broken this, this rule about, about behavior at um, private dances. Um, so the novel of manners. So while this novel is typically comedic and satirical, the sentimental novel is not. It's usually more serious than the novel of manners. Um, the characters usually go through periods of, of pretty intense emotional distress, I would say. And and that strand in Evelina is is most is most apparent in the episode with Mr. McCartney, whom we'll talk about a little later in this presentation. So this genre appeals to the reader's sensibility. So the character's moral virtue is tied directly to their capacity to feel, to their sensitivity to another person's happiness or their misery. And these characters are generally rewarded for balancing their feelings with, with reason. Conversely, characters who who don't have this capacity to feel, think, think Mrs. Jukes, for example, or whose feelings obstruct rational thought and behavior. Um, they get carried away with their passion. They're usually punished. Uh, and Richardson's Pamela was the forerunner of this type of novel. I, I, I'm thinking of the scene in Pamela when 
when Pamela catches the fish, the, 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 the carp, and she feels really bad for the fish, and, and Mrs. Jukes um, doesn't. Um, that contrast between Mrs. Jukes and Pamela um, is coming to mind as an illustration here. Um, and in the preface to Evelina, uh, Bernie actually uh, praises what she calls the pathetic powers of Richardson. That's a significant line. So some things to think about as you look at the front matter of the book. Um, this is one of the passages. I think this shows all three strands um, of the, the Bildungsroman, the, uh, the novel of manners, and the sentimental novel. Just take a moment to read this passage, and then I'll highlight some of the things that I think are important. So, for example, the, the, the strand of the Bildungsroman, the coming-of-age novel, um, these phrases here that, that the protagonist makes at the age of 17, her first appearance upon the great and busy stage of life, and that the novel um, traces the natural progression of this character of obscure birth for the first six months after her entrance into the world. And then there is the novel of manners strand. So to mark the manners of the times and, the, and, and to uh, describe how um, the character's ignorance of the forms and her inexperience in the manners of the world occasion all the little incidents which the three volumes will record. And then finally, there's the the sentimental novel strand, which is in this line, a virtuous mind, a cultivated understanding, and a feeling heart. These are words you're going to want to look for as you read the novel. Words like feelings and sensibility and hearts and tears. Oh, so much crying. So much crying. So here are some things to think about as you read the preface, how, and, and the other front matter as well. Uh, how is Bernie's use of the term novel similar to or different from the way it is used by Richardson and Fielding? And how does she relate her work to theirs? How does Bernie defend the novel against charges of immorality? So as late as the 1770s, um, we see just in her in her own preface that the novel was still um, had a very poor reputation. She talks about that. And what role does gender play in shaping her defense of the novel? And finally, taking together, what do the dedication and preface tell us about literary critics and their influence in the late 18th century? So see, the 18th century is is the birth of literary criticism as well. So Evelina has a large cast of characters, certainly more than we find in Richardson's Pamela, um, and I, I think more major characters than we find in any of the other novels too, like Defoe or or Fielding. And it's 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 pretty challenging to keep them all straight, and some of them don't appear until uh, later volumes. Um, so. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to talk about all the characters in this video. I'm just going to talk about some of the major ones, starting with the female characters. Of course, we have to start with Evelina. She's our protagonist. She's the daughter of Sir John Beaumont and Caroline Evelyn. And the rest of the female characters I split into to two groups. There is a group of, of women that are are closely out, uh, allied to Evelina, and I call them the Berry Hill group. Berry Hill is where uh, Evelina is raised uh, by by Reverend Arthur Villers. We'll talk about him in a minute. One of his neighbors is Lady Howard of Howard Grove. Evelina spends a lot of time there because um, she's good friends with Maria Mervyn. This is Lady Howard's niece. And Maria is one of, uh, well, she is Evelina's primary female correspondent in the novel. And then a little later, another one of um, Reverend Villers' uh, neighbors, Mrs. Selwyn, will take Evelina uh, to a place called Hotwell near, near Bristol. Um, but all three of these women are um, 
um, supportive of Evelina, and and we're we're supposed to like them. Uh, Mrs. Selwyn is the most interesting character in this group. Um, she doesn't appear until volume uh, three, but but she's she's absolutely fascinating and quite entertaining. So we'll we'll certainly spend some time talking about her in class. The other group of women uh, are antagonist characters, and and they are they appear in London, uh, and then in in Hotwell, the the resort, the 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 spa town where Evelina spends most of the third volume. So there's Madame Duval, of, of course, Evelina's maternal grandmother. She's the main um, female antagonist in the novel. She seems to, to um, she wants, she, she's manipulative and uh, she wants to, um, to, to use Evelina to achieve her own, her own ends. And in London, at Holborn, um, uh, we meet Biddy and Polly Branton. They're members of the Branton family. This is this is a pretty uh, repulsive <laughs> merchant class family. The Brantons. We are not supposed to like them, and they live uh, in Holborn at Snow Hill. And neither of these girls is um, uh, neither neither one is very pleasant. And then. And then in the third volume, you will meet Louisa Larpent. This is Lord Orville's sister, and she's also pretty awful, uh, lazy and languid, always complaining about something, Louisa Larpent. Uh, so there are, just while I'm looking at the screen, this reminds me that there, there are three hills in Evelina. There's, there's Berry Hill, which Evelina associates with with. with rustic peace and and bliss and the protection of her um guardian reverend villers and then there's snow hill in holborn where the branton family lives and and um uh, evelina can't stand to be there and then in the third volume uh she spends time with uh at, at the residence of uh a lady named by the name of beaumont and that's it at clifton near near Hotwell and that's where she she winds up reuniting with a lot of the characters who appear in volume one so the three hills of Evelina so these are some of the major uh, female characters and we'll talk about some of the men starting of course we have to start with Arthur Villers this is he's, he's Evelina's guardian he's her confidant most of her letters are to him and her her moral guide very much a father figure but then she attracts all of these other men um in her various um trips to to, to london and to uh hot the hot wells lord orville this is evelina's primary love interest and and you figure out pretty early in the novel that we're supposed to be we're supposed to be rooting for lord orville and then there are these other men all of whom um um are, are, are pretty awful. Uh, Sir, Sir Clement Willoughby, Mr. Lovell, and Lord Merton, Tom Branton, and Mr. Smith. Now, the first four that I've mentioned, these men are all upper class. They are, they are aristocratic men, um, whereas Tom and Mr. Smith represent the, 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 the merchant middle class um and and all of them with the exception of lord orville are are targets of bernie's satire i'm going to mention one more individual but i'm not going to say too much about him because to do so would be to spoil a key component of the novel and that will be mr mccartney um he's a mystery man um very very important um in in he's kind of a foil character and his his troubles and his the, the the mystery of his identity are very important. So I just shouldn't say too much about him, but he's a major figure as well. Another important aspect of the novel is how 
Bernie establishes, builds this world. You know, she 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 recreates the London world. And one of the real appeals of the book, I think, for for readers in her time was must have been her descriptions of of these these uh, these different locations, particularly in London, um, but also um, the Hot Wells and Clifton. Uh, so. What I've done is I've categorized these different places based on her trips. So there's the the first London trip with with Lady Howard and uh, um, Captain Villers and and Maria Villers, and they go to these places that are associated with the, the very sort of fashionable places. Um, not embarrassing to be seen at any of these locations. There's the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane. This was a theater that was, at the time, managed by England's most famous actor, David Garrick, who was Samuel Johnson's protege. He was a member of Samuel Johnson's club, and so very much in the world of Frances Burney uh, when she was growing up. I think this is this interior image of Drury Lane is actually the theater after it was rebuilt around the turn of the century. I don't think that's how it actually looked in Bernie's time, but it was probably pretty close. Then there's the King's Theater Haymarket. This was an opera house. There's an important scene at the opera that takes place in the novel. The Brantons come out of it looking pretty, pretty bad. Then there was a social club called the Pantheon, um, very fashionable, very ritzy. It burned down. Um, and it's obviously it's architecturally it's it's modeled after the famous Roman uh, building, the Pantheon. Very impressive. And then Ranala Gardens. Um, this is uh, you don't see a garden here. This is this was called the Rotunda. Um, it's like a social space. You see little little niches in the wall there where people could sit at tables and, and be served uh, wine and cheese, I guess. Um, while the orchestra you see there on the right would, would play music. Um, so these are the places that she visits during her first London trip and she's enthralled. These are captivating places. And some of her experiences at these locations are unpleasant, but there's nothing about the places themselves that is um, particularly threatening. That all changes on her second trip to London. She spends her time um, with the Brantons and Madame Duval at other social and other social spaces that were far less fashionable, and uh, in fact had developed bad reputations. There's the Haymarket Theater um, and the Long Room at Hampstead Wells. The Haymarket was leased by the playwright Samuel Foote. He was an, an enemy of. Uh, Henry Fielding. Uh, Henry Fielding's own plays had been produced at the Haymarket um, prior to the closure of the theater in 1737. Samuel Foote took over in the mid-18th century, uh, but by the time Evelina was published, um, his name had been uh, tarnished with some pretty significant uh, scandals in the 1770s. I'm not going to get into it here, but, but, but by the time Evelina was published, Samuel Foote's name had had acquired a kind of um oh oh just th th there was scandal around him and in fact he died the year before evelina uh was published i think in 1777 the long room at hampstead wells which evelina finds completely unimpressive and then there's vauxhall gardens which was once quite fashionable but by the 1770s it had it had diminished somewhat. I like this overhead shot because um, it shows you the, 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 the size of these, these pleasure grounds, um, which is important for understanding what happens to Evelina when she, when she goes there. And then another incident happens at Marybone Gardens. An unpleasant situation occurs at Marybone Gardens. And these places were often associated um, with um, sort of clandestine, illicit sexual activity, prostitution, and uh, Evelina gets caught up in some of that. I don't want to say too much about it, but um, you can look for that later in the novel. So some things for us to think about, um, to talk about in class. 
as you read, pay attention to the rhetoric of sensibility and how characters communicate their feelings or don't. And, and how does the capacity to feel facilitate moral virtue in the novel? What does Evelina's commentary about about people, the places, the people she meets, the places that she visits, what does it reveal about the values and manners of different social classes? She does travel through um, very different social worlds in the novel, and that's important. What is her own position, uh, and how does she how does she fashion her public self? You know, how does she wish to be seen, and how does she try to control that? How do socially sanctioned gender expectations influence characters' actions? And I don't just mean for, for women, but also for um, men. And to what extent do the different characters corroborate or challenge these expectations? And then finally, what role do the arts and aesthetic taste play in developing the discourse of sensibility, social class, and gender? In the novel, you'll find that that there's there's a lot of discourse in the novel about art, about about architecture, about uh, music, about graphic art, opera, dramatic performance. I mean, all of the arts, uh, literature. Um, there are allusions to Pope and Swift in in this novel, so uh, and classical writers too. So there's a lot of talk about the arts in the novel, and you really need to pay attention to that because it. It, it intersects with um, these themes of sensibility, social class, and gender. So a fascinating novel, and can't wait to get into it in class. This concludes the uh, video introduction to Francis Burney and Evelina. <laughs>